Falcon 9 had a very successful record up until recently, and they had a failure, one of their upper stages. What happened, they concluded, was that they had a pressure monitoring line for the liquid oxygen, and that line had a clamp that was apparently kind of loose and with vibrations from launching, and apparently it finally broke, or at least made it leak. The liquid oxygen that leaked out cooled the engine components. That then interfered with their ability to restart the engine. So they were grounded for 15 days and just said, okay, we're just going to remove that sensor in line. They don't really need it anyway. They had enough redundancy of other sensors, so they're not going to use that. They did lose 20 satellites at that launch, but of course, they've already got 6,000 or so. An extra 20 satellites is kind of nothing when we get down to it to SpaceX. That'd be the second time they've lost a batch of satellites. The last time was actually due to solar weather. They had launched, and they tend to put the satellites up in a very, very low orbit. The satellites themselves have thrusters, and they raise themselves up. And the problem was, there was a solar storm they hadn't accounted for. It heated up the atmosphere enough. The atmosphere got bigger, and there was enough extra drag that those satellites couldn't make it to orbit. So this is actually the second time that SpaceX has lost satellites. Now, this caused a bit of a temporary scare because the Falcon 9 is what launches the Dragon crew capsule, which was supposed to be the backup for the Starliner in case they really have too many problems with the Starliner to use it. But it was only 15 days they solved the problem, so that problem has moved on. Okay, so speaking of SpaceX, Starship, of course, that's the big one. Flight Test 5 is coming pretty soon. Now, Flight Test 4, it was just a few months ago, and it was pretty successful. It pretty much demonstrated they can get a rocket up pretty much to orbit, and they can actually, under control, bring back both the first stage booster and the second stage. They prove they can do that. Everything else is kind of details at this point. They've already shown they can launch stuff, and it looks like it's going to be possible for them to do the recoveries. Now, what's going to be different in this test is that they're talking about bringing the booster back to the launch site. Before, they tried to just drop it to a spot in the ocean, which they apparently came pretty close to hitting. But this thing, they call it the chopsticks, but basically the booster comes back to the launch site and you know these extra things go out and grab it. Now, this picture that's up here, that's just an animation. The real chopsticks that are there, they don't look like this animation. But anyway, hopefully we'll have some real ones. But this is going to be definitely a step forward if they can do that. Along the lines of Starship, this has really been floating around. This particular picture, it's gotten a lot of attention because somebody put out a picture comparing the three different versions of the Raptor engines, which are what are used for Starship. The Raptor 1 engine, Raptor 2 engine, and Raptor 3 engine are there. And you can see it's going from a really complicated looking mess to a slightly small, incredibly streamlined looking kind of thing. Now, how did they do that? Well, first of all, of course, you know they have this philosophy of the best part is no part. There's always this design goal of just getting rid of stuff whenever you can. That way you have fewer things to fail. It's easier to manufacture it, all these things. Now, some of the stuff is not a completely fair characterization because the very first, the Raptor 1, that was really pretty revolutionary. It was really the first rocket that had the kind of closed cycle where they really used the maximum power available to them from the fuels. And they had a lot of sensors. Okay, so there's a lot of sensors and a lot of probably a lot of extra stuff they didn't really need. They managed to cut that down for the second version. And actually, the tests that have been done so far are only in Raptor 2. And even the next test, I think, is still basically using Raptor 2. The so Raptor 3 is much simplified. Now, they've gotten rid of a lot of the sensors, which they didn't really need. But they also simplified it a lot by using 3D printing manufacturing. There's a lot of pipes that just got absorbed inside of it. So in reality, some of those pipes are still there, but they're all just created during the assembly process and totally hidden which is actually a really good thing because it also means that they have much better control over the temperatures. It's much more robust. They don't need as much heat shielding or maybe they're getting rid of their heat shields because everything is kind of protected just within this nice smooth body that they have here. So the comparisons here, I filled in some of the numbers. So the mass has been going down. The weight of the engine itself is going down from 2,000 kilograms to 1,500. The mass for all the associated hardware that you're seeing there also went down even more drastically, and the thrust went way up. Uh, those are, that, the units are there are tons of force. So if you imagine 185 tons, that's the force exerted, um, and then it's up to 280 on the Raptor 3. So they're making the engines smaller, they're making them simpler to manufacture, which has always been a key part of any of the SpaceX stuff, is designed for manufacturability and reusability. So they're doing all that, and it's kind of made clear by that picture. Okay, I'll just talk a little bit about some upcoming launches. Polaris Dawn, this is one of the private missions. This is interesting because it'll have a spacewalk. That'll be the first time any private people have done a spacewalk. The Starship Flight Test 5, of course, we already talked about. 
And also we talked about the next uh, ISS mission to take astronauts, either two or four, depending on um, how they do that. Presumably they'll be sending a couple of empty seats up. Um, then the question is, of course, who doesn't go and who comes back? Looking a little further out, the Europa Clipper mission is coming up, and this is NASA's, this is a big one with the Falcon Heavy rocket. Basically, it's going to orbit Jupiter, but it's going to be making a lot of flybys of Europa, which is one of the moons there that's a really very interesting one because they think there's subsurface oceans and that sort of thing. That could be launching in October. Some minor ones we've talked about, the AST Space and Mobile before, they're the ones that were, along with SpaceX, promising direct cell phone access from satellites, eventually with everything, not just SMS messaging. And then Dream Chaser, this is the space plane from Sierra that will be also a way to get cargo up to the space station and back. They could bring it back. That's actually it. So any questions, comments? Okay, that's it. Other space-related videos or slide presentations by me are available at the link shown here. That includes a list of videos at my YouTube channel so you can view them or subscribe for notifications about future videos. These presentations are mostly made as part of the meetings of National Space Society's North Houston chapter, and the link to that is shown. Topics like these are presented as part of a monthly news segment, and there are also lots of other interesting speakers and open discussions. You can attend in person or online via Zoom. Come join us.